Hey guys, welcome back to the Cinema 4D tutorial series on constraints. In this part, we're going to be talking about two different constraints, the spline constraint as well as the distance constraint. So once we go over them and talk a little bit about them to see what they do, then we're going to see if we can pair them up together and see if we can make something with them. So let's start out with the distance constraint. So I'm going to create a cube for this example. I'm going to duplicate it over. And with that one selected, we're going to shift select the second one and call up the command for the distance constraint. Now, by default, whenever you first apply this tag, you're not going to be able to actually see this in the viewport. So you're going to need to enable show guides. And as soon as you do, what we see is this large circle that appears. It's like a, an outline of a sphere. Basically, this is setting the distance and it is set to the clamp minimum distance that allows the other object to get close to this one in the center. So, for example, if we were to take this cube here and move it, you see that we cannot move it any closer than the outline of that red sphere. It won't go any closer than that. But it also means that we can take this cube here in the center and we can move that around to push the other one out of the way. So what I'll do is go into the tag and I'm just going to bring this value down to about 200. That way when we move this one, it looks like it's pushing it. Now we can also add another target. So we'll click on the add button. We'll drag the cube in there. And now we can push and we can also pull. So it's going to push and pull. And the reason for that is because the second one is set to clamp max. So that is the maximum distance that is allowed before it starts to pull it. Now Cinema 4D also has its own constraint that does this same identical thing, but it's called the clamp constraint. So if we were to select one cube, shift select the other one, we could go to character, constraints, add clamp constraint. Now the difference here is that this constraint only has one solid red line that goes between the two. You can see the red line going between the two cubes, and that's pretty much the only visual representation of this constraint that we see in the viewport. So if we look at some of the properties in the tag, it is currently set to fixed position. And what that means, if we were to take this cube here, and if we were to move it, you can see the other one is moving with it. That's because it is set to fixed position. So if we were to set this to minimum, and change the distance here to say 200 and move this over it's going to push it so we can add another target this one will set to maximum and the distance here for the maximum I want to set this to something like maybe 400 and now when we push it over it's not going to do anything and the reason for that is because I forgot to drop it into the target link box so we'll take the cube and drop it in and now it should work there we go so we're pushing and we're pulling so this is doing the same thing as the CD distance constraint was doing the only difference here is that the CD distance constraint has the visual representation for the minimum and maximum field whereas the native Cinema 4D clamp constraint only has a solid red line. Okay, so now that we know what the clamp constraint or the distance constraint does, so what about the spline constraint? So I'm going to go to a top view and just draw out a very quick spline with the pen tool. I'm going to set it to cubic and we'll just draw out a little S shape. And I guess we can use a cube again for this. So we'll get a cube and I just want to shrink that down a little bit. So with the cube selected, I'm going to come up here and add the CD add spline constraint. So we'll go into that and it's going to be asking for the spline. So we'll drag that in the up vector. Not really worried about that right now. 
we're going to activate the tangential. So we'll turn that on. And then we can talk about force position in just a moment. Uh, if you don't enable force position, this means that you can actually select the object and push it around using the axis handles. However, if you don't want to do it that way, you can activate force position. And now you can control with the slider its position on the spline. Now some of you might be thinking this looks almost identical to the align to spline tag and you would be correct. The align to spline tag is basically just a constraint and it works the same way as the spline constraint does here for the CD tools plugin. All right, so whenever I think about these two constraints working together, I think of some type of railing system, like some type of a conveyor. So what I'm gonna do for the next couple of minutes is model up something quick that we can use to illustrate that. So I'm just going to start out with the pen tool. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to draw the profile shape that we're going to use uh, for the sweep nerb. All right, so we need to just quickly zero out these to just kind of make sure everything is nice and straight. You can see some of them are kind of bent out of position a little bit. Just gonna square these up. All right, so that's the profile shape, but this thing is rather large. So if we were to select it, you can see just in the X value, it is currently just over 600 centimeters in length. That's rather large. So I'm gonna shrink it down to more like maybe 20 or 30 centimeters. I think that would be a little bit better. So that's the profile shape. So now we need to create a path spline. So what I'm gonna do is just draw out something like that. And again, we'll have to just quickly square these up. All right, now with the two points selected, I'm gonna to go to the chamfer tool and just click and drag to chamfer those to kind of round them out a little bit. And now we can create the sweep nerb. We'll turn the caps off because we don't need them. We'll deal with that later. So we need to rename this one to path. And this one here we will rename to profile. So now we can drop the path spline in and then the profile. So there's the shape of our railing system. Uh, you can see it's actually inverted and flipped upside down. So we'll need to deal with that. But I just want to quickly lengthen this. So I'm going to go to the path spline. And I'm going to lengthen the edge a little bit. And also this side over here, just to give it a little bit more length. And what we want to do is uh, select the profile spline, go over to the axis mode, and we want to flip this thing 180 degrees. So we can do that really quick. And now our railing system is oriented correctly. So we want to duplicate the path spline because we're going to reuse it in a few minutes. So we'll make the sweep nerve editable and I'm going to close off these ends. So with the close polygon hole tool, close those off. And we want to create just a very quick mock-up of some type of roller bearing system that's going to go on the inside of this. So I'm just going to create a cylinder. These are going to act as the wheel bearings, or not really a uh, not really a bearing like a ball bearing, but more like a wheel bearing. So we'll position this over here and shrink that down a little bit, maybe a little bit more. And this here is also rather large. So let's go to a front view and push that up, and let's pull that down so we can. Shrink that down a little bit to get it to fit. That's still rather large, so the radius I'm just going to take down. All right, I think that'll be okay. So we'll control, click, and drag over to duplicate it. And then we'll go to a top view. We'll select both of them and then control, click, and drag down to make two more. Now we'll select all four and I'm gonna hit Alt G to group them in a null. 
and this is going to be the little end unit uh, it's going to have a little hook hanging so what we'll do is we'll create a tube and this tube is way too large so we're going to need to shrink that down and we need to change the orientation on it inside is a little big so we'll drop that down to about there we'll make that editable and I'm just going to extrude up a couple of these polygons at the top something like that I think will be okay and we'll drop that into the null Now I'm going to rename this null to end because that's going to be our end unit it's also going to be the controller once this rig is put together so what we can do here uh, just to see this a little better I'm going to turn off the grid and if we were to select the end null and give it a spline constraint drop in the path spline that we duplicated earlier and you can see it drop down a little bit and the reason for that is because the spline actually needs to be raised up so we'll raise that up just a little bit probably need to go up just a little bit more all right and now if we were to turn on tangential we can do the force position option and now you can see what this is going to do it's moving through the corner and it's almost as if those little cylinders are acting as roller bearings and it's rolling along the track system now there's one thing that I quickly want to point out if you notice when that little hook gets to the corner it slows down so I'm just going to try to move this slider at an equal rate and if we move this along you can see it slows down when it gets to the corner and then it speeds up in the straight the reason why it slows down in the corner is because the path spline is currently set to adaptive for the intermediate points I'm sure some of you at some point have animated something moving along a spline and you're trying to get it to maintain a constant rate of speed but for some reason it wants to slow down and speed up in the corners and this is the reason why so you need to change it from adaptive over to uniform and then we can change the number or the segments and for this we could just use a number of about 30 and that should give us enough so just keep that in mind if you're ever animating something along a spline using the align to spline tag and for some reason it wants to speed up and slow down in the corners the reason why is because you need to change it from adaptive over to uniform but you also need to make sure that you have given it a high enough number of subdivisions so now if we were to use the position on here again now it animates at the same speed even when it's going through the corner all right now now we can start adding more of these so what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to uh, delete that tag for the moment and I'm gonna take this in unit and I'm gonna duplicate it and I'm just going to push that over to about there and let's do a third one and also a fourth one I think four of them will be okay for now alright so what we want to do now is start applying the distance constraints but before we get to that we want to make sure that the hierarchy is set up correctly and it's going to be in the right executable order so what I mean by that is Cinema 4D will execute objects starting from the top and working its way down. That's the execution order. So that means that whatever object is going to move first and be the main controller object, that needs to be at the top. So that's going to be this end object here. Then we have the second one, which is here. That's going to be the second one, the third one, and then the last one otherwise if the execution order is incorrect we're gonna get some skipping and moving around when we start to play through this alright so let's start applying the distance constraint now so we're gonna select the second one because remember we don't want to apply the tag to the first one it's going to be applied to the second one so we're going to select the second one and then we're gonna hold down control select the first one and then add the distance constraint or if you don't want to use the distance constraint maybe you want to use the clamp constraint so you can add that if you like but for this because it actually shows the visual representation of the minimum and maximum values I'm just going to use the distance constraint 
So we'll add that and we're going to turn on show guides. So this is going to be for the minimum. So what that means is that it's going to start pushing it as soon as I move it that way. And I think right about there will be okay. Uh, we also want to set up the maximum. So what I'm going to do is add another target. I'm going to add the end null in there and set that to maximum. And the maximum distance, what I'm going to do is just kind of add that out to about right there. And turn that off. Now we want to select the third one. Hold down control, select the second one. And we want to add another tag to that one as well. And we can leave the minimum there. We want to add the maximum. And the maximum on this, first of all, we need to add the second one in there as the target. And then we can take that up to about there. And we're going to do one more. So we'll select the fourth one. Hold down control, select the second one. I want to add the distance constraint again and turn the guides back on. We'll leave the minimum value where it's at. We'll add another target, drop the N2 null in there. And for the maximum, we'll take that up to about there. All right, so now we can start adding the align to spline tag if you wanna use that. Or in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and use the spline constraint. So the way that this is going to work is we're going to give each one of these four objects a spline constraint tag. So we'll start with the first one. We'll add the spline constraint. For the spline link box, we'll drag the path spline into there. We want to turn on the option for tangential, and we want to activate force position. So we're gonna use this slider here to control the entire rig. This is going to be like the master controller. So now we can click on the second one. We can add a spline constraint to that. We can drag in the path spline, turn on tangential, but we do not want to force the position. Now the reason why we don't want to do this is because the distance constraint is going to determine the position of each one of these hooks along the rail. So if we were to force their position, that's just not going to look right. So now we can do the same for the third one. Add the tag to it, drag in the spline, activate tangential, and we'll do the same for the fourth one. So now it should be ready to animate. So if we click on the tag for the first one and just move the slider back and forth, it should animate correctly. And everything looks good. Now there is one little bit of an issue here and that's because the end of this rail actually needs to be extended out a little bit. Uh, that way we can actually get these hooks to come back around that corner. So we can do that really fast. So what I'll do is I'll select that plus the path spline and I'll select that and just drag it out to about there. And we'll do the same for this end over here just to give it a little bit more length. Click back on the tag. And now let's try to do this again. So that one's gonna come in and push, push. It's gonna go around the corners and off to the other end and let's just make sure that the corners here look good so we'll back it up one more time play through there that looks pretty good all right so i think i'm going to go ahead and wrap up this tutorial for now but don't worry because we're going to come back in a later part and continue on with it because we're going to be adding some more parts to it as well as some other constraints so if you have any comments or questions, feel free to comment below. And as always, guys, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next tutorial.